Okay, so I should probably start before um, before my time finishes. Um, yes, so unfortunately you've chosen to come to my talk. Um, it's on user experience design. Well, that's what you would think by the name, but ends up being talking about user-centered design for most of the time. So um, we'll talk a little bit about humans as well, um, and I'll explain who they are in a second. Um, but basically, this is me. I um, originally did a computing and psychology degree at, at UTAS, so that was my Bachelor of Science. And then I went on to do a, a uh, honors in HCI, so human-computer interaction. Um, for the last few years, I've been working for um, contracting for Secret Lab. Now, um, they're a company that makes lots of things. Um, Clearly not emails that send their employees or contractors logos. So <laughs> that is one thing they don't do. But um, if you wanna if you wanna contact me, those are pretty easy. Obviously the first one's Twitter, and the second one is my Facebook. Um, so Adventure Time is one of the things that I quite enjoy talking about. It's one of the things I quite enjoy watching. Um, if you haven't seen Adventure Time before, it is an incredible cartoon. Um, created by initially Pendleton Ward and a bunch of other um, people. It seems on the outside like a kid show, um, but I can assure you it is definitely not. Um, it has lots of, lots of different themes, lots of a massive backstory, and uh, lots, of, lots of fun things to theorize about. Um, one of the references from that first slide you saw was I Flew the Pig, which comes from, a, um, comes from an episode called Card Wars, where Actually, they were playing a game similar to, to Magic, um, where you had certain cards that you could put down and um, you would flip them. Now, um, some way through that, Jake actually forgets that you can flip pigs, and that's all to do with the way the cards are laid out. Um, so I flip the pig is at the start of my talk now. So that made a lot of sense. <laughs> These are humans. Now, this actually makes more sense because humans are real things, humans. Um, so, so, Adventure Time takes place about a thousand years after the apocalyptic event that um, ends Earth, and the current theory is that most humans went to Mars, and the rest of the humans that got left behind stayed underground and evolved into kind of like fish people, um, and some ones with long limbs and other things, so humans come in all different shapes and sizes, and some of them have other animals on their head. So, um, the first thing I want to talk about is that this isn't a technical talk, so I'm not going to talk about code. I really like to talk about code, but today I'm not going to. This one's more of a, of a hand wavy talk, so first I'll give you a defini definition of conjecture. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of design is based on what people like, especially in, in HCI, you look at what, you approach it from a scientific perspective, but humans essentially change their minds every five minutes on what they like. Large, large groups of humans will, will tend towards certain things, but humans are really incomplete in terms of how we've mapped them. So there's no perfect solution to anything. And what, I, what I'm about to say, some of them are opinions. Um, and opinions are like lots of things. Um, in this case, Opinions are like nipples. Uh, everybody has one. Uh, some people, oh, so, some have firm points. Others are barely discernible through layers. Some are displayed at every opportunity, regardless of whether the audience has stated, "I am interested in your nipples." And cats have 19. So that's actually from a from a, um, an email by by David Thorne at exactly that time. Um, and he's actually a brilliant, uh, brilliant internet writer who makes lots of quite funny internet jokes. Um, and so I would definitely recommend looking him up. He makes lots of opinions as well. So for my first, my first bunch of words, so in, in my hand wavy fashion, I'm going to talk a lot about um, a lot of domain specific words. Um, so if you don't quite follow along, ho hopefully you'll be able to figure out what I'm talking about regardless of the, the long list of new words that I'll be talking about. Um, so we're gonna talk about user experience design to start off with, talk about user centered design, um, talk about user testing, so how you're actually going to go about testing your app with real people um, in an everyday environment, and common, 
uh, common pitfalls that people fall into, um, especially when they're designing, designing apps. So, first part um, is user experience design. And so, this was the main focus of why I wanted to give a talk, and it's, user experience design is sort of all about the end-to-end -end experience. When people open up your app, how they feel about certain things, what, what causes them to do certain things in your app, why they would use it, um, how efficient it is to use, it encompasses a whole bunch of stuff. Basically, the experience of using, using an app or any, any system or anything, really. Um, you can apply it to not just software design, but to lots of other like, physical things and lots of stuff. So um, it encompasses a whole bunch of different fields from visual design, so that's quite obviously the visual aspects of your app, the, the physical layout um, of things on the screen, how nice they look, the aesthetic, um, to information architecture, so how information is actually structured, so whether or not people can, can absorb the information from, from what you're trying to, to give them, or if it's just too confronting and they just, they just blank out and just look at the pictures. Um, and that, that affects like, a, lot of, a lot of the way people, especially the way people view apps that are designed to, to part information to you. Um, it talks about interaction design, so the way people um, move, uh, the, the way people touch interfaces, the way they interact with um, different sections of the app and the way they think about um, those sort of parts in your app. As well as usability, so usability gets thrown around a lot and I guess it's just a general term of how easy something is to, I guess, use um, but how easy it is to approach from, um, from not knowing what it does. So things like affordances and all sorts of other uh, uh, affordances are, are basically what it, look like, what, what it looks like it should do compared to what it actually does um, and how you approach that. And finally, human-computer interaction, which gives a little bit of context to all of those theories. So how humans actually, um, actually do all of those things and how how different human factors can influence the way that we have to approach um, designing software or hardware or what have you. So first we'll talk a little bit about user-centered design, and I really liked that joke, so I was gonna put it in. Um, you just have to deal with it. Um, so, user <laughs> so, yes. Um, so this is actually the main part of my talk because this is the part that I've, one, done the most in, and two, I really like the way, like, as, as I mentioned, I did a psychology undergrad, and it's always been a passion of mine to include people in the way that you design stuff for them because it seems really natural in my head to go, well, I'm making you something, I really want you to enjoy that, rather than I'm making you something to do a task. It's, it's supposed to definitely complete that task. It just seems like there's a massive disconnect in the way that we've traditionally approached, um, especially software design, um, when it doesn't need to be like that, when you can actually um, make it a little bit better. So, oh, this one's a really long one. Okay, so um, there are a few steps in user-centered design. Um, lots of people have different definitions for it. This one is one that lays out the steps um, pretty easily. So the first one is identifying the user, and I'll go through each of these um, in turn. And there's lots of animation. So there's researching the user, figuring out what they do, um, creating goals, figuring out a, a, a way to actually uh, accurately measure um, what if you're doing is, is correct. Um, then designing, prototyping, testing, and then doing that again and again and again until you get to a point where you're happy um, that your uh, they're happy that your application or product is, is giving the experience that you want to provide. So the first one is identifying your main user group. Now it sounds, it sounds pretty simple, but can often be a little bit more elusive than you would think. So um, when, you, when you first approach, uh, I'm gonna talk about this in the context of app design, because that's what I do for a living. So I do, I do iOS, um, iOS stuff, and there are, lots of, there are lots of different people that your app could be targeted at, and it depends on the context that you're, that you're doing, whether you're doing for a client or whether you're making a game or, or whatever, but you've got business professionals, um, everyday sort of casual users, um, you've got tourists, frozen banana salesmen, and royalty, all sorts of different, all sorts of different um, people that you could be targeting at, and each of these needs to be treated differently because of the way that they use technology differently. Um, and 
if it's not if it's not clear who you should be targeting, and I guess if you're targeting targeting every every person, maybe you need to start to refine your your design a little bit to look at at targeting a, a, a main group of persons so that you can actually make the experience really good or make the, the experience as be, the best you can for uh, most people rather than trying to make it kind of okay for everyone. Um, so the second step is to research your users. So um, look into the, the, the users you identified. Usually um, people will break them up into uh, primary users, secondary users, and tertiary users um, with the focus obviously being on making sure your primary users are as happy as they can, secondary, and so on. Um, so if, if your tertiary users have some sort of problem, it's obviously a little bit less of a priority. Um, so what I mean by research is looking at their habits. Look at how, look at how they use, um, if, you're, if you're making an iPhone app, look at, it, look at how they use iPhones, look at how it affects them in their everyday life. Sorry. Um, and because you're, you're obviously designing an app to fill some sort of need or whether that be entertainment or whether that's a specific job that you need done. Um, so look at what they currently do and, and see how they interact with the current system they use. So if you're, um, the example I might use a few times through here is um, basically a, a tourist app. So if you're going to a like an amusement park or um, a tourist location, um, one that has set points around the place, you want to be able to show people around and show them how to get um, from from places to places and where everything is. Now, um, the current method that, that people use for that are guidebooks. So like a little pamphlet or something like that will show you a map. It'll show you. Um, points of reference so you can figure out where you are. It'll show you the, the other points of interest so you can figure out where you want to go. Um, and now, looking at that, you obviously want to mirror some of that in an application, um, but not, uh, the problem with a book is that it's not dynamic. So you have the opportunity to make lots of things different. Um, so that's the sort of things that you have to look at. How people use guidebooks, how people um, interact with physical medium and how you can how much of that you should mirror onto um, onto your digital applications. So, um, taking the example of um, of businessmen, um, so businessmen really like to do business. Um, they have they have desks. They do their work, um, and that's what they do for most of the day. So, doing business is. Uh, like they're, they're interested in getting business done as quick as they can because they want to get their business done and they want to leave. So um, businessmen um, may, may want applications that um, are efficient. That, that might be something that's really important to them. So looking at how they approach efficiency, how they actually organize things is a, is a good place to start on researching for businessmen. Um, if, I haven't got a second example, but if you're looking at um, something like Royalty. They may not be interested in using a lot of applications. Um, if you're if you're trying to to um, market something for some reason at Royals, you might want to make something that appeals to the way that they use technology or get other people to use technology. So it's all about considering the way that um, that people do things in your design process. And hang on. Um, and people's backgrounds also change um, a lot of the way that this happens. So things like culture, things like um, computer experience, and expectations of technology also change. So um, these, these factors are really, really important when you're considering um, design things. And a way to represent um, all this research that you've done, um, there are three main ways to, to do that with user-centered design. And these come up all over the place. So personas are basically a formal profile of your main type of user or a type of user, um, not necessarily the average user, but a typical user. So one that um, is likely to, to use your app. Um, and personas basically describe um, something like the, the characteristics of the user. So their age, where they live, their economic status, um, the type of devices they're likely to have, um, all those sort of important factors and just list them all so you can, you can figure out um, easily at a glance what, um, what your users are. Now scenarios are sort of like giving context to these personas. So a scenario might be something, a day in the life of James Baxter. Now James Baxter is a horse, 
Um, he rides around on a, on a beach ball, and he just, he just wants to make people happy. So a day in his life is, he gets up, he grabs his, he grabs his hat, um, and he rides off into the sunset until he finds some people, blows his hat up into a beach ball, because that's, that's how hats work, and he just rides around on it. And he says, James Baxter! And that's what he does, and he has a really fun time about it. Um, and so, and then at the end of the day, once he's made people happy, because that's, that's pretty much all he does, he's content with himself, he packs his hat back up into, um, packs his beach ball back up into a hat, and then rides back off home. And scenarios like that, although obviously you may want to be a little bit more detailed with real people, um, or, or real people are probably more detailed than James Baxter, or more complex than James Baxter, um, help to give your designers or you the foresight to um, look at how they interact with everyday things. So James, um, James takes his ball with him. Um, he, he basically takes everything he needs with him for the day. Um, so, but because he's not particularly complex, he doesn't, he needs, doesn't need to carry a lot of things. But if, um, if a human, for example, wants to take your app with them for the day, they'll need to take some sort of phone, they may need to take some sort of bag. Um, it's lo lots of things like this that, that interacts with the way that you design, um, you design things. Um, especially, uh, like, for example, if you um, are making some sort of running application, you need to think about how, how the users are going to be interacting with your app while they're running. So uh, a, standard, a standard person might take, take their phone with them, um, start, start actually jogging, then launch your app, um, which means that the phone's going to be jumping around all over the place. And so if, you're, if your scenario that, that you've planned out um, has this sort of information, in it, it becomes much easier to start testing later on. Um, and use cases are basically the boiled down version of these. So the minimum steps required to get, um, to get a task done. Um, so it, just, it, it usually is some sort of grid or uh, thing that, that shows the, the user's interaction with the world on how to get tasks done. Um, or how to, how to achieve their goal. Now, um, one thing I mentioned a little bit earlier was that um, cultural differences can make a lot, of, um, a lot of difference in the way that people interact with software. Now, this guy, Tim Oliver, he's, um, he's been an AUC guy for a little while now, but he's not here this year, unfortunately. Um, he takes this into account in his iComics app. So if you have a look at a little bit in the middle there, the only bit that's difference between the left and the right image there is that the page direction flip, uh, switch is flipped. Now, in a lot of, in a lot of um, uh, Asian cultures, you've got books that go from right to left, so the other way around, um, the way that we read them from left to right. So the way, the way that he represents that in his app is a switch that, that physically just flips all the pages the other direction. Now, if you never thought about that, if you're creating an app for someone that you never, never really thought about, which is sometimes the case when you're developing for clients, um, not taking this into consideration might make your app completely unusable because people are trying, to, are trying to have to swip through the entire application to get to the end of the book to start the book because they started at the end and all sorts of things can go wrong. So, so this is like a really simple, a simple example, but it's one that makes a, quite a large difference to the overall enjoyment of people using um, using, especially if it's a large percentage of user base. So the third part, third thing that I want to talk about is creating goals. So how do you actually know um, when you've made an app that's good enough to ship? And goals, goals are basically um, determined by the kind of characteristics that you want to enhance. So if you're targeting businessmen, maybe efficiency is the thing. So number of taps or number of uh, time to complete a, a task. Um, so if you take that into consideration when you're, when you're designing stuff, um, trying to minimize these, um, these things or these goals or trying to get down to these goals is something that you'll know when, um, when you've, you've put a lot of work into it. Um, and the, the, uh, this obviously changes all in the, the context of the users. So designing is the hard part and um, that's, it's, it's really the, uh, it's, it's really the part that you need to start not, not at a computer, but at a pen and paper. Because, um, if you start at a computer, you're already thinking too far ahead in terms of technical stuff. So, uh, you're already thinking in terms of, in terms of views, in terms of, um, in terms of the way things animate, the way you're going to represent stuff in code, and that's, that's too far 
um, removed from, from the way that people interact with stuff. They don't interact with code, they don't interact with um, your layout directly, they interact with the way that things change in your layout. So, um, and if you're going from, um, it's like a, a, lot of, a lot of things now are going from desktop to mobile. So considering that um, you, you, may be, you may be porting an app from, from that, you have to think about the way that people use desktops, think about the way that people use mobiles, and think about the way that the interactions change between the two. So do things directly translate into mobile? Most things don't. But uh, things, like, things like dragging, uh, also things like um, moving cursors and clicking and small, um, small spaces don't necessarily translate into, um, into mobile very well. So um, these are all things that need to be considered. And the first way, the first easy way to do that is wireframes. Now, this is basically you just drawing how your app, how, how you want your app to look. And this becomes kind of useful later on um, when you when you go into into full implementation mode because you've already got some sort of um, visual layout and you don't have to make it up as you go along because you've thought about a whole bunch of the components before you start. Now, wireframes um, are generally something that can look a little bit like this. So this is the work I did for, um, for Port Arthur, which is like a, funnily enough, a, a tourist destination in, um, in Tasmania. Now, Port Arthur wanted some sort of information booklet style tour guide. They didn't, um, they didn't necessarily want a guided tour, but they wanted to have all the information available for the site available at once. So, um, so this, this particular location, the guard tower, has, has photos up the top, um, it has some audio clips attached, and this, this particular wireframe was talking about how um, that we're going to interact with the audio system built into the app. Now, this is pre-iOS 7, by the way. I thought of this, they stole my idea. Sorry, no one else thought of this beforehand. This is definitely mine. Um, it now doesn't work because there is a different tray, you can't see. Um, Basically, we, we thought a, a, a tray is a fairly common way of interacting with audio. It's not something you want to look at all the time, but it is something you want to have access to some of the time. So having it completely hidden is, is really hard on a mobile device because you haven't got windows, you haven't got ways of, of segmenting um, parts, but overlaying stuff is not too bad. So the, um, the, the app initially had three different states of, of audio player. It had a complete hibernate mode, which was just a bar. It had the, the mini mode, which you can sort of just press play and stop, or go back 30 seconds, and the full mode that had the scrubber and um, other controls with that. Um, now these wireframes sort of um, give you a picture of how this was going to work. Each of the different controls are labeled. Um, uh, some of the interactions are labeled here, where how people would, um, would move things up and down, and what would happen when certain buttons were touched. So these sort of wireframes are really useful because um, it gives you a chance a little bit in a second to, to start prototyping and having a look at how people are going to use your app. So prototyping is, is the, the act of doing a quick, quick implementation or proof of concept of certain ideas. So for example, the, the audio tray, um, which was changed later on, and I'll tell you a little bit how that was changed once we started implementing it. Um, Doing fast implementations and rapid iterations of, of ideas helps to, to nut out the problems, like the big glaring problems and the small nitty problems with, um, with lots, of, uh, lots of your different controls and different UI elements. Um, there are two main types of, of prototyping. There's, there's low fidelity prototyping. So that's basically, I guess the easiest way to, to approach this um, and it seems kind of silly, but if you, if you were to draw all of your app, so not just, not just wireframes, but, um, but actually all the content and, um, and different screens of your app all on say, lots of pieces of paper, you, would, you could sit it down in front of someone conceivably and ask them to, to tap on the part, like basically use the application. So tap on the part that they want to go to um, and, and interact with the app. The, uh, with low fidelity prototyping, all you would do is swap out the, the image that they're looking at once they tap on a certain thing. And it basically gives you an idea of the larger scale um, interaction problems that you could be facing. Now, um, it's not something that needs to be done all the time, but it's something that can be there um, if you just want a proof of concept or a quick, quick sketch up and see whether something works. 
Um, and I mean, an example of that is something like um, a, big, a big menu system. So if people take a long time to scan your menu, um, it's not something that needs to be implemented to figure out that that happens. So someone can, can look at it and go, wow, this is really confronting. You have too many options here. Um, I kind of don't know where to, where to start. And that's, a, that's like simple feedback, but really easy to start, start thinking, well, maybe I need to start simplifying the way I do things. Um, and the next, the next type of prototyping is high fidelity. So um, it's, it's basically the next, the next level up of um, implementing something that, that mostly works. So um, it, it may not be functional, like the app, the app obviously isn't functionally complete. You may only want to test a certain section of it, but it looks, it looks pretty close to how, how it's actually going to function. And you can, you can do this through the, the iOS, um, the way that iOS and OS X is built now is built for rapid prototyping. So it's built so that you can just test out something. And a lot of, a lot of the interactions and, and animations and stuff can be faked just with images. So if you want to test out to see whether, um, whether that, that audio tray works, for example, you can put an image of an audio tray down there and make it, make it look like it reacts to button taps. And this is high level prototyping or high fidelity prototyping. And it helps to, to nut out a little bit more of the, um, the problems that you can get before you actually um, before you actually get to, to proper testing. Um, and, and to see whether things are actually mechanically feasible as well. Um, so obviously testing is a really big thing and you would never want to test something before shipping it, ship something before testing it. And um, because, because it's, <laughs> it's, obviously, it's obviously a big problem. Um, and the hardest way Oh, the, sorry, the, the hardest thing about it is that um, a lot of stuff will give you very formal definitions of testing. So if you have a look at focus groups online and, and see how the way that big companies do testing, they get a lot of people or small amounts of people to look at stuff for a long period of time or a short period of time, depending on what they're doing, and, and give really detailed feedback. And you obviously don't have access to this, this sort of, these sort of resources. So um, everyday user testing is one of the things that, um, that I'm quite interested in and, the way, and um, is, is actually quite easy to do. So um, feedback is, is obviously one of the, the most important parts of this, so I'm just gonna emphasize it a little bit. Um, so if you do nothing else, give, like, obviously ask for, for really detailed feedback from your client, because basically they're paying you to do something, and if they're not telling you you're doing it wrong, at the end of the day, they're not gonna be happy with you. So, so feed, detailed feedback is really, really important. And tell them to think about it in terms of um, not, not necessarily from their perspective, but try and, try and get them to um, put themselves in other people's shoes to see whether, because they, they may know a little bit more about your clients than, than obviously you do, because you're, you may be new to the, to the field. Um, so, so try and um, get them to give you um, really detailed feedback. Um, now the, the second, like the, a much better thing to do is try and find people from your main user group. So go and have a look at, um, so for tourists, for example, try and find people who are actually tourists to test your app. Now, when you make something that's, that's good enough to, to, to let people use, that doesn't have um, big bugs that stop them from using it, give it to someone to test. Um, go, and, go and see how they do stuff, and I'll talk about that in a second. No, I'll talk about it right now. So watch people as they're using your app. That's probably the most important thing I can say, is have a look at what they're actually doing. Because it's not enough to send an app to someone and say, please use this and tell me what's wrong with it. Because a lot of the time, people don't know what's wrong with it. They can't put their finger on it, because they can't use, like, if they can't use it, how can they tell you how bad it is or how good it is? So a lot of the time, only you can actually figure out what people are doing wrong, because you designed the way that it's done right. Um, and so one thing that people don't often consider, but one thing that's probably the most important in this case is um, looking at what people tap, but um, what people don't tap. So if you put a big feature um, on, a, on a screen and no one ever presses it, then you've obviously done something wrong. And it may be because, it may be because you didn't make it look like a button, like iOS 7 buttons, or it may be because um, the feature is hidden behind some sort of control. And it might be the control's really cool. Like in Port Arthur, for example, we had a fold-out map, and it used a, um, a third-party paper fold view. But basically, the, the fold-out map um, was hidden behind a swipe gesture. 
And for the first part, no one ever really noticed that the swipe gesture was there because I never thought that I should swipe left on a table view um, on an app that had static, static um, slots. So we ended up adding um, that little um, map nub that I don't know if it was on that screen, but um, is definitely in the app now, which shows the user that you can actually drag it. And what we find is a lot of people actually just tap on that. So um, they, they don't even think that it's a, it's a dragging thing, even though it has grooves and all sorts of other stuff. But, um, but people actually just tap on that because they're like, oh, what does that do? And it folds up the map and then they think, oh, wow, that's actually really cool. And then they remember that feature's there. So um, really watching and learning what people do gives you the most experience on how people are using your stuff. Um, the problem with watching what people do is that depending on how creepy you watch them, they will do different things than if they're out in the field. So there's a, there's a big, I can't remember what the effect's called, but it's basically like a laboratory effect where if you're observing something, it's probably going to be different to how it naturally occurs because people get self-conscious and all sorts of stuff. So people are less likely to to want to explore things because they may think that they're doing things wrong. I mean, tech people don't necessarily have this problem. So if you give it to someone, um, like for example, the person I work with, Paris, um, if you give something to him, he'll quite happily explore everything and break everything he can. Um, but a regular person will just be like, hmm, this is quite nice, and just have a bit of a bit of a tap around and then give it back to you. And then you just have to frown at them and say, keep going. Because, <laughs> because um, trying, trying to get people over this and encouraging people to to explore is something that can help you in the long run. Um, but yeah, just be aware that you, you won't be able to find everything in, in user testing just by watching people because people do act differently. Um, the next big thing is to test in the environment it's going to be used in. So if you, and by environment, I don't just mean like the simulator versus the device. I mean like using the device in your house versus using the device in the theme park or tourist spot or whatever. Because it may be um, that your house is really nice, cozy, and warm, and you have full function of your, all your fingers, but out in the rugged terrain, icy tundra of Port Arthur, it might be that you don't have use of your fingers and you have to try and do something to, to be able to swipe, yeah, lick things to swipe it, I don't know. But <laughs> it'll probably work. Um, so using, using it embedded in the environment helps to give you some of the, some of the um, aspects that you may not be able to consider because you haven't actually been in the environment before. Um, and it's even better if you can get tourists in the environment to use stuff because they, the way they, they idiosyncratically do things interacts with the way the environment is. And if I go back to the running example um, that I gave before, if people are um, stationary, your app may be really easy to use, but if they're actually running, if the buttons are too small, they may not be actually have the, the mobility in their hands to press something properly because it's shaking up and shaking up and down, <laughs> shaking up and down, um, and, and uh, potentially really hard to, to hit. So um, one big example of this, and this was um, not necessarily a software issue, um, but ended up being a software issue. This is the Port Arthur app, by the way, the little map number I talked about is in the top corner. Um, it looks kind of nice, that was my design as well. So um, basically it just has a carousel of all the, all the different images in the entire app. People can look at stuff they like and it tells them um, which section of, the, um, part, which section of the, the place that they need to go to, to look at um, the uh, rest of the related content. Um, so one of the things that the Port Arthur people wanted to do was have, give out these, these iPod touches with the app on it. And they weren't quite as colorful as this, but they were similar, similar design. So the iPod would sit in a lanyard and go around your neck. And that was really cool. Now, can anyone see why this is a problem? Because they're gonna hold it upside down. So when, when they actually used the app, it would have been the wrong way up. And while that seems like a really simple thing, by default, iPhone apps don't, don't rotate all the way around because they're not supposed to. But, oh, I mean, they can, there's no, there's no reason not to, but they, they usually don't, so the home, home button's always at the bottom. But we found that when we got one of these, first thing we just put it on, we're like, oh, this is really useless. So it, it was a 10, 10 second fix, but, oh, well, maybe a little bit longer than 10 seconds, but it was, yeah, but it, it, just, it just ended up making it usable. So if we had to shift that without seeing that, that would have been a real pain, because people would have just been trying to hold it all the weird way. Why can't they hold all these iPods? Um, so use the resources you have at your disposal. Now, um, presumably most of you have friends. Um, 
Some of you may have colleagues and, um, and all sorts of different contacts that, that you have, uh, that have a range of different, um, the range of different, um, both technology usage and, and jobs um, and experience with using these sort of, uh, these sort of apps and devices. So and one, one thing that's really, um, one thing that's really important to utilize as much as you can is your family. So families usually have a wide range of people in it and are usually really accessible and open to, to using stuff. Um, for example, I use um, my mother a lot for testing because she has absolutely no idea, she has an iPhone, but she has no idea how to do anything on it beyond send, um, send messages. So giving her the Port Arthur app was really useful to me because she kept trying to, to tap on things that weren't buttons and do other stuff, which eventually changed me to, um, to emphasize certain points on the screen. Um, I don't know whether the map, the map nub was um, something I did on that one or whether it was another occasion, but those sort of things become really useful um, for, for testing and it's free. So you don't have to employ anyone to do this, you can do this in your own time. Um, the, the problem with family testing is that they're more likely to say, yes, this is lovely, dear. I would really like to use this when I do blah, blah, blah. Um, because they want you to do well and they want you to feel confident about, well, most families want you to feel confident about what you're doing. Um, so you may need to preface that with, please tell me what this actually feels like to use rather than don't, don't just make me happy um, and explain to them why that feedback is useful to you. Yeah, people that don't actually like you, yeah. Um, and basically, you're just going to do this over and over again. So you're going to design something, you're going to prototype something, and then you're going to test it. And you're going to take the, um, the results from your testing, the information you found out about the way people use stuff, and factor that back into your design and keep going again. And once you've, once you've got a bit of momentum on this, it becomes quite easy, especially with iOS, to rapid prototype things because you can send out new builds um, especially with something like test flight, if you have lots of multiple users that you want to get feedback from, you can deploy builds to, to lots of people at the same time. Um, and this becomes uh, a really useful feature to be able to get um, feedback for. And this, can, this process can be as formal or as informal as you want. Obviously, the more formal you make it, the easier it is to accurately say this, this fixed this problem and to track things later on. If later on you find that you've got a little bit too much information, you don't know what's going on, um, keeping it formal can give you a, a structure for, um, for organizing all this sort of stuff that you're doing. Um, so one thing you might, you might ask yourself is that there wasn't an end to that spiral where you, you constantly do it. And I guess that's where the goals come in. So, You've got to know sort of when it's done. So when you when you finish to the point where you can actually say this is really cool or this is good enough, which I hate that term, but if, if it's really if it's really if you've got time constraints or other things, it fits if it fits in between your schedule to say this is as good as I can make it in the time that I have, then you need to sort of know when when your end clause is. Um, and this may come about organically, or this may be something that is artificial, but um, keeping that in mind. Um, when you're setting goals and other stuff is quite important. Now, um, common uh, things that people, people get wrong or that people have to remember when they're doing this sort of work is um, client versus cus customer satisfaction. So um, there's that really great picture online of a tree with a, a tire swing and like this is what the client wanted. It's got three, three sections in it and it's a ridiculous tire swing. Um, and then you've got all sorts of other things, um, and at the end one, it's like this is what they actually wanted for their for their customers, which is basically just a tire with a string attached to it, um, something that people can use um, and something that they want to use. Now, it's really important that you convey to your clients that their satisfaction is tied to what their customers feel about their things. And sometimes, like, a lot of a lot of business people will know that, but um, some of them think too much in terms of efficiency and um, and business talk or waterfall models or other stupid terms that um, to, to be able to see that at the end of the day, um, if you're making really great software, it's got to be with, um, with the happiness of, of the people you're providing it to. 
Um, and it, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's got to be something that they want to use as well. So the more, and, and that's something you can convey to clients is that um, the happier someone is and the more someone wants to use something, the less effort it is to train them, the less effort it is for them to, to use it, and the more they'll want to, to um, do that task or, or take less time or whatever to, to do it in the future. Um, one thing that a lot of people say when they give stuff to me or um, I try to avoid saying when I give it to people and then you say the next slide um, represents what I think of people, um, is it's obvious how it works. And it's, of course it's obvious how it works because you wrote it. You literally wrote how it works. So if, if it's really obvious to you, you have to really keep in mind that it may not be obvious to other people. So that swipe gesture was like, uh, I actually the other day, um, working on a similar um, app to Port Arthur, I implemented a, a page curl thing on a photo. And to me, I'm like, you just, like, they, they literally asked for a page curl on a photo, and I'm like, it's really obvious how that works. You grab the photo with your finger and you curl it up. And we gave it to them, and they're like, what do I do? And we're like, it's like you, no, you, you asked for a curling page, and so you, you grab it, and, so, they, and uh, so it just, it wasn't obvious to them how they interacted with it. And so that's, that's something that, um, was really apparent to me. I'm like, well, hang on. I guess to me in the tech world, curling pages is you grab it and you drag it with your finger. But in the real world, I guess a book, you grab it and you drag it with your finger. But... <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, like, um, so it's just, it's, it's one of those things that um, you have to constantly remind yourself that you're not other people, or other people aren't you. So, <laughs> Basically, basically, planning for mistakes is really important um, because people often have no idea what they're doing, um, and that's not that's not their fault. Sometimes it's 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 so, like and, and that's that's one thing that you have to plan for is that someone someone probably doesn't care that much about your application. That was one thing we had to convey to some of the clients as well is that that people come to. Um, to these um, these parks or these tourist destinations, and they may not actually care that much about the information. They might be there with their family, they might be doing other things. So they literally have no idea what they're doing there. Um, and so they're gonna make a lot of mistakes in navigating stuff and, and uh, play around with things. So planning for those and helping people to minimize the effect of, of making mistakes is really important. Um, now, when you're, when you're testing, this is a really, really annoying one, and one that makes me mad when people do it. Like they give me something, and I'm like, just moving stuff around. And they're like, no, 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 no. Let me show you how to do that. And I'm like, that defeats the whole purpose of asking me to use something that I don't know how to use because you've just you've just told me how to do something. And once it goes to market, you're not going to be able to tell every single person um, how to use something. That's basically just how business works. You give someone software, then you train them in using it and doing it. Like that's. That's not a goal you want to aspire to. That's just a, a, an effect of the way that, um, that we, we currently do things. So um, yeah, don't show people how to do stuff. Um, try and get people out of, like, if, someone, if someone just, you give someone a thing and they just like, move around a few things, they go, hmm, very nice. Maybe you should encourage them to, to do some stuff with it and explore a little bit. Um, this one from my friend Mick Jones. Um, he, go, <laughs> he said, we were in the lab the other day and um, I didn't know how to do something. It was something. He turns around and he goes, it's not my fault you're unsophisticated. <laughs> and it's very true it wasn't his fault I'm unsophisticated, but if I want to be able to use the thing, I need to know, I need to know how it works. And if you just assume that, uh, and I guess if, you're, if your main user group was me, for example, and I'm not sophisticated to understand your interface or to comprehend your interface, then you've probably done something wrong. Um, and taking that into consideration, the 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 ex past experience of people is um, is something that's really important. Um, and this one is and isn't um, something that you can fix, I guess. Um, when you're developing stuff, obviously nothing nothing all like so obviously things don't all get done at once. So some things will be finished, some things won't. And try and minimize the amount of stuff that shows up in um, like the glitches that show up in your in your testing. Um, when people test for you. So um, turn off features that don't work, disable things or hide things that aren't there um, so that you, you're testing sort of in isolation. And I guess that's like in science where you sort of um, 
remove the extraneous variables from, from problems to figure out what actually causes something. And um, if you're constantly going, yeah, don't worry about that, I'll just, I'll just fix that later, then maybe, maybe you should think about sort of simplifying your prototypes to make, um, to make better results from, from your, your testing. Um, and the sort of linking back to when it's done, um, if you spend too long over testing, you can get the opposite effect of kind of what you want. You can become a jack of all trades instead of trying to get a really good experience for, for your main user groups. Um, if you try and cater for too many stupid people, you're gonna end up with, um, with a, a really, really um, not fun, I mean, it doesn't, it's not always the case, but it can be a really, really not fun experience if someone's handheld through every stage of, of the process. Um, and if you want a big game example of this, um, I really, really love Legend of Zelda series. I really, really don't love Skyward Sword that much. Um, a lot of things, a lot of things happen in it where they constantly tell you over and over again what's happening, what just happened, and what's about to happen at every step of the way. Um, and that was that was a real big um, thing for me, where I'm just like, I, it, it removes the enjoyment of this game because the the game itself is quite cool, but a lot of things just just sort of removed all the the fun that I had. Um, so. Yeah, it can be a real, a real thing. Um, yes, yeah, so another mistake people make is that once they go, it's shipped, it's done. I can wipe my hands clean of it, it's, it's finished, I'm done. And for things like university assignments, that's really cool because you never have to see it again. But for, for actual products, um, keeping in touch with the people that use stuff can be a really big help to, to achieving your goals of customer satisfaction if that's what you're trying to get. Um, and adding in feedback capabilities, adding in um, ways that people can tell you what's wrong or what features they want added. Like it'd be really cool if they did this. I mean, Apple will give you that through app reviews, um, but if you give some way of interacting back to your users, they're more likely to be, to be less angry with you if you can say, well, yeah, I've actually thought about that feature and I don't have the time to do it or, or maybe it's, it's queued up for a, an earlier thing when I, when I get more money to, to build the project. People like reasons for things and are less angry when they have reasons for, um, for, for bad stuff that happens. So um, don't just assume that, um, that it's done when it's finished. So I wanna leave you with a few um, inspirational quotes. Um, so one of Princess Bubblegums is, uh, the answer was too simple, I was just too smart to see it. And this is actually quite relevant, especially when you're looking at Apple stuff. If trying to make things more complex and harder to, um, more complex and more things on the screen so that people can get the most out of the experience is not always the easiest way to convey more information. Adding in um, tools, and uh, people are quite good at it now, tools that um, meld into the interface and information, like a big, a big buzzword that's thrown around is information, information becomes the interface, um, is, is something where you, you, you directly interact with the way things are presented to you to get um, further uh, in the process of getting more information or whatever. Um, and being really simple is really hard, so sometimes you have to take a step back. Um, one from, from Jake is sucking at something is, is the first step to being sort of good at something. So don't be disheartened when um, in the first set of designs people are like, this is really bad, I can't use it, I don't know what's going on, I feel really lost all the time, because that's just the first step to being sort of good at something. So um, keep going, it's not, it's not too bad. Um, eventually you can be like the Earl of Nem Lemon Grab um, and one million years dungeon, no trials. So um, that concludes the end of my talk. Um, if you would like to contact me, I have an email address because it's the future. I also have a Facebook account and a Twitter account, surprise. Um, and because I didn't talk a lot about actual interface design, talked a lot about the way that you approach designing, um, Paris's talk tomorrow uh, in the morning is, is talking about iOS 7 design, about good things, bad things, lots of stuff. So I'd recommend going to his talk to um, give a little bit more to the visual design um, aspect of of experience design and all sorts of stuff. So that is the end for me. Thank you very much.